we can go home and enjoy our meal in time. And last week I was talking about the, you know, about the armor, how we bring forth armor is for battle. Please tell me about armor is for battle. The battle is very, very important. And today I want to talk about the battle. Before you go to the battle, you put on the armor. And the armor, full armor, you know, so I think Thursday or Wednesday I was sharing with the group that is the armor of light, how we use the light as the armor. And that's God's word. This armor, this warfare and this all is not like the natural warfare, but the Christians right from the day one or God created the earth. He wants us to have this battle in his own way. And that is the Christian journey is all about this battle, all about this battle. And we come to the end of our journey, we should say, as Paul is writing to, uh, uh, you know, Timothy, when he's writing, he writes the same thing, you know, how this battle, we have to ba do the battle in such a way we win. It's not you can put all the heavy armor and everything there, but lose the battle. You see, when David and Goliath were really, you know, engaged in the battle, Saul wanted to put him all the armor. You know, I'm trying to bring in a balance to see what is meant by the armor and what is meant by the spiritual armor. And Saul was thinking in the natural. Here is a Goliath, he's standing there, he's a big, big, tall man, and he is, the whole Philistines are against the Israel. Israel army is running back, running back, frightened so much so. So when the shepherd boy came there to the scene, he has got no knowledge of the war. This is a mirror image of what the church should be. Shall we shout hallelujah? Even in the Old Testament, God was portraying a picture in such a way, we are not a runner, we are a winner when we engage this battle in a spiritual sense. Why this has happened at this point in the Old Testament, I tell you, a New Testament is coming. Shall we shout hallelujah? A new covenant is coming. A new order is coming in this world. So David was standing there as a, as a man looking at this big Goliath and he is despising the children of Israel. He is prepared to take him on. Saul and tried to put him all the armor and everything there and because Saul was doing everything in the natural and he was trying to put him on the armor, helmet and all the sword and everything there but actually David looked far beyond. Saul was looking at only the natural warfare and David was looking at the forefront, what God is going to do. <coughs> and he was prepared to take him on. The rest is a story. I don't want to tell you. This battle, even David at that point, he engaged the war like a New Testament warrior. Shall we shout hallelujah? So this, this morning I want to encourage you is, what is this battle, what is the armor we had? Light, and he could see the light. He could see, the put on the armor of light. He could see himself. When he put on, he can stand in front of a mirror. When it is two o'clock, when all the curtain is full, everywhere is dark, will he stand before a mirror? Can you see anything there? You won't be able to see if your curtain is good enough. But when you switch on the light, you can stand before the mirror, you see as it is in the daylight. Am I right? Try tonight. <laughs> stand before your beautiful, expensive mirror and stand. Can you see your face? You won't be able to see you who you are. You won't be able to see anything in that mirror. But you can be seeing only when you switch on the light. This is called armor of, armor of light. When you switch on the armor of light, I can see who is this Daniel Sam. Myself. This is the first important thing. In our life, when you don't say who I am, we become a runner, we don't become a winner. Shall we shout hallelujah? It's important, the armor of light in our life. You can put all the other armor, the armor of light, when you switch on the light, you are able to see who you are. Then only you know how you can, how you can fight this battle. Switch on the light, the armor of light, because in the light of the gospel, you are able to see who you are. And you can take a stock of this warfare. If you don't, you know, you have an image of yourself, but devil tells you, laugh at you. No, that is not boy you are. That is not boy you are. You are defeated even before starting the battle. When you switch on the light, you are able to see your weaknesses, your, 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 your shortcomings. God, I needed you. God, I needed you. 
It's not what I wanted to do. It is all I needed to you. Whenever you come before God, it's not about singing and praising and worshiping God. Touch the button and switch on the button. You are able to understand. You are able to be humble. You are able to be polite. You are able to be under the anointing. You will be able to stand under the anointing. You are able to invite the anointing. And God can overpower your life. You are not a runner. You are a winner. Without switching on the light, the devil tell you a story, you are this and that and the other, and we are defeated in our life. I sadly see people's life. Because you know why? They never switch on the light, they are looking on a mirror, closing their eyes somewhere. When you switch on the light, it energizes me, Sam, this is what you are. This is, every day you have to take a stock of yourself, dear believers of God, I tell you, every day you need to switch on the light and stand before the living God, that is called prayer. When you stand and stand in the place, God tells you who you are. You can tell so many things to God, you can tell so many things to people, you can, you can tell so many things to the nation, but when you stand before the living God, and just to press the button, the light comes up, everything, everything who you are. That's the place of worship. When you see all that I adore is not in me, God. All that I adore is not in Andrew. All that I adore is not in Silla. All that I adore is not in Sam. All that I adore is not in Paul. All that I adore is only in you. We are able to see our own self, our weaknesses, our, all our battle we can say. Then God, no. When I stand in the mirror, I say, my tummy is bigger. I need to stand with people. I need to stand with people who have got big muscles. I don't stand with people who are already looking droopy like that. I want to stand with people who got, I like to stand with Babak. I would like to stand with somebody who has got the muscle. Train me for the battle. You don't run away from them. Stand with them to say, I like what you have. I wanted to see that I wanted to rise up in the kingdom of God. Because the weak man don't make me strong, strong man make me strong. I look at him, how did he get that? Constant. I stood firm. I stood firm on the treadmill. I stood firm on doing what I wanted to do. I was riding the motorcycle. Experts trained me. You know, they're really police officers who used to do the, all the motorcycling for Diana when she's going on the motorcade. They used to ride the motorcycle. So those people train you. They don't make you weak. They tell you. They tell you off. I told you last time, they tell you off that sometimes it's very humbling. Ask Babak. <laughs> it's very humbling. But I tell you, they make you a warrior. They make you safe on the road. They make you to fight the battle. When you want to, when you want to build your muscles and everything for the war, for the battle, you know, for training yourself, you don't, you don't stand with people who are really already weak and set up a cannot get up. You want to people who can jump up and down, get up and do everything that you want to be with those people. Spiritually is no different. Spiritually no different. But that all that we adore is not in any of those men, any of those women. All that we adore is in him. And if you can worship the king of kings and the lord of lords, God can make every one of us equipped in the way. And I want to teach you some good stuff. Not only putting on the armor, the armor of life. Christian church, advanced church. At once, I'm really proud of every one of you, including our children, including our youth, including our young person team. You know, they're going to bring something very powerful to the nation. I strongly believe there will be a powerful team. We will use the media mountain. We will use the, all the mountains for the glory of God. Apostle Robert Henderson thought about the seven media, seven mountains of influence. I want to put our children in every mountain. Because I want to become the great leaders in everything what they do. In their profession, in their job. Devil will not belittle them. Devil will not bring them down. They will be warriors. If God given me time, that's what I wanted to do. Make sure they stand on every mountain of influence. Shall we shout hallelujah? Our children, our generations to stand in the place. Farnworth will change for the glory of God. So first of all, switch on the light. The great light of the armor. When you switch on, we are able to see who we are. We want to stand with the people who has got the muscles, who has got the knowledge, who has got the experience. Don't battle with them. Our battle is not against the flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers of darkness. When we stand in the place, we can say, we can do a good battle. This morning, I want to move on quickly, but I want to tell you not about the armor of God, full armor of God we talked about, the, light, the armor of light, but I want to move on to this thing of battle. 
how do we do this battle? You know, if I don't want to be with those men <coughs> who are well experienced in the motorcycling, I never would have passed the test. They were looking at me, is Sam going to pass the test? No, Sam, it is not for you. You cannot go on this speed as I'm going. <laughs> you cannot go at the speed you need to go if you are a motorcycle rider. And I'm struggling to get up to the speed it needs to go. Because it's, you know, they need to train you in the fastest speed you can and how you control the vehicle. And I'm just going very safe speed. No, Sam, you're not going to pass the test. Because you need to know how fast you go, how you control the vehicle. You know, in the life, sometimes we need to have the thing in our mind, God, I want to be trained and I want to be equipped in this battle. I want to be a winner in this battle. We need to get our focus right for the battle. When Paul is writing, let me take you to 2 Timothy. Let it come on the screen for me, please. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 to 8. It's a very powerful word, we all, because this is the end statement of every one of us in the church today. Every one of us, including young and old, 2 Timothy chapter, 7, chapter 4, verse 7 to 8. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask a young man to come and read that for us. He said, okay. He said, what is 2 Timothy chapter 4? Is that right? Is it coming on the screen? God is good. Janet, can you come and read that for us, please? Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 to 8. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Thank you. Is that wonderful? The prize is for all. Please tell me the prize is for all. It's not just for Paul only. You know, this is what I wanted to tell you. All that we adore is in some man. Paul is saying here, <laughs> all that is for all who eagerly look forward to his appearance. And the price is not just for, see, this is my biggest problem in the whole ministry over the years. You know, people always think, because, you know, they don't switch on the light and see who they are. They think all the, all the price is just for Pastor Sam. The, all the price is not for just Pastor Sam. It is for if you can eagerly look forward to his appearance and the price is for you. Please tell me the price is for you. Because you know why all that we adore, the worship, <coughs> the teaching, the preaching, and the ministry all flow together in such a way we wait forward, we are looking forward to the day the price is for me. The price is for me. Otherwise, what happened, all that we adore is somebody. Something, somewhere, we don't know how to fight the battle, and off the way we take a run. We just run and come to the same place. Why did I run? I'm in the same place because, you know why? All that I adore is in a man, or a woman, or somebody, Theresa May, or somebody. We can never get to the place. And Paul would say, when he's writing here, I did a good fight. I did a good fight. Paul was not a very big man. Very big man. Paul was a very small man. I mean, I've seen in pictures, you know, some sort of a drawing. Paul was not a victim. Seven feet, uh, you know, six feet, or five feet, uh, nine, or somebody big. He was a very small man. But he could say, put back verse seven for me, please. I have fought uh, the good fight. I have finished the race. I have finished the race and I have remained faithful. Shall we all say this together, please? Shall we all say together? Because this is our final destiny. You know, I was just watching the cyclist and winning the greatest medal. And, uh, and the thing is, they're just uh, doing all those things and eventually they won't race. We need to be like that. We all need to be winners in the kingdom of God. Shall we all read this together, please? One, two, three. Is that wonderful? God wants us to be. In the battle, what we happens, I want to tell you something. 
don't be a, in this battle because it's belong to the Lord don't be a negotiator of peace I'll get to the end of it I'll get to the point never be settle for something less we want to have God's plan in our life don't settle for peace when you settle for peace when you read the, when you hear the full message only you will know where I'm getting where I'm taking you to but don't set up a shoot me and after thing never settle for less never settle for less many people become negotiators in this battle because the battle belongs to the lord you need to know the principles of this warfare because it's not you know if you take the sword you die by the sword which we see in the battle all these were defeated everybody destroyed because if you t- take the battle if you take the sword you die by the sword please tell your neighbor if you take the sword you die by the sword but have you got a sword yes i have got a sword yes i got a sword but it's a spiritual sword you know it's not the natural battle in that battle also <coughs> many people negotiate and settle for less see never settle for less to be a fighter to the end and i will give you all the reference today if the time allows me i want to go quickly i want to get this teaching across your heart so you can fight the good fight and one day you can tell i fought the good fight i have finished the race i have remained faithful to you god until the end the battle will be ongoing in your life but if you want to fight a good fight don't be a negotiator in the middle or without understanding what happened you got a problem let me take you a natural analogy to you see i was in england at the time and the gulf war was starting more or less the whole problem what happened now starting now and at the time george bush senior was in power and between kuwait and all the problems started and what happened actually george bush suddenly senior hey stop the war let us sign a treaty in the desert and the 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 used to be the american colonel used to be like a bear they call him as a bear shroska or something his name and i watched this on very closely because the headquarters from the white house and instruction was given settle settle quickly settle quickly sign everything there in the desert they're signing a treaty <laughs> why would he i'm not talking in this natural sense i'm not a politician but i tell you what you sign with the devil has got no meaning <laughs> hello that's why your peace making won't work because you know what you are signing you are signing a peace treaty with the devil because he never the prince of peace is jesus christ is the prince of peace devil is not the prince of peace he come to rob and steal and kill and destroy signed everything paper had changed you know the history george bush junior has to fight and lose a lot of stuff in the second war why in the battle when you are engaged with the devil god i am going to fight a good fight my battle is not against the flesh and blood but against the principalities and powers of darkness i see the i see the enemy because i pressed the button i looked at myself i look at the enemy the enemy is defeated already what is written on his face he is defeated i'm standing my ground how do you fight this battle how do you fight the good battle oh right i'm just negotiating i'm playing some games you can't play a game with the devil you can't really go along with the devil and win one day you'll be defeated because the battle belongs to the lord not to you don't try to do that sort of arrangement with the devil because he is not a, he is not a, he is not a principal man he will stab you at the back one day he will destroy you so you need to be careful whom you are fighting with you need to know the enemy first the enemy has got no order no rules of engagement when we are all sinners jesus died for us so he is already won the victory and he is our role model devil is not our role model so don't negotiate with him when he enemy come through one door he will run through the ten door you know why he see you you are in the light you got the armor of light you can switch on the light and fight the battle and bring forth victory see what happened thousands of people died innocent people died because of the treaty in the first treaty when you do 
When you eliminate it and bring an establishment without, without destroying the whole land, you can bring righteousness and justice in the things of God when we engage the battle without going into a negotiated settlement. Because see, never, even in the promised land, when you are coming near, you know what happened? You read in the Bible. I want to take you to Joshua chapter 9. Keep it in Joshua chapter 9, please. You know, Joshua chapter 9 is a good example of how we don't inquire God, how we do something, a settlement, and then we feel we are fooled completely. See, spiritual warfare is the one which is going to take you to the higher place in the kingdom of God. It is not about the numbers. It is about the quality of the team, quality of the warriors. See, what happened in chapter 9? Joshua chapter 9, the Israel are coming to the place completely. Now all the kings, and I want Steve, if you can come and read this for me, please, from the scene, because it's quite a bit of reading there. Let me have a breather, because you will understand what is really happening. Joshua, Moses is gone. Joshua is coming to this place, closer to victory, great victory. Now all the kings west of Jordan River heard about what had happened. These were the kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jezebites who lived in the hill country in the western foothills and on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea as far north of the Lebanon mountains. These kings combined their, their armies to fight as one against Joshua and the Israelites. But when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to deception to save themselves. They sent ambassadors to Joshua loading their donkeys with weathered saddle, saddlebags and old patched wineskins. They put on worn out patched, patched sandals and uh, ragged clothes and the bread that they took with them was dry and mouldy. When they arrived at the camp of Israel at Gilgal, they told Joshua and the men of Israel, we have come from a distant land to ask you to make peace treaty with us. The Israelites replied to these Hivites, how do we know you don't live nearby? For, it is you, for if you do, we cannot make the treaty with you. They replied, we are your servants. But who are you, Joshua demanded? Where do you come from? They answered, your servants have come from a very distant country. We have heard of the might of the Lord, your God, and all that he did in Egypt. We have also heard what you did to two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, King of Sion and Hezbon, the King of Og and Bashan, who lived in Asheroth. So our elders and all other people instructed us, take supplies from the long journey, go meet with the people of Israel and tell them, we are your servants, please make a treaty with us. This bread was hot from the oven when we left our homes, but now, as you can see, it is dry and mouldy. These wineskins we knew when we, when we filled them, but now they're old and spill open, split open, and our clothes and sandals are worn out from our very long journey. So the Israelites examined their food, but they did not consult the Lord. Then Joshua made a peace treaty with them and guaranteed their safety and the leaders of the community ratified their agreement with a, with a binding oath. Three days after making the treaty, they learned that these people actually lived nearby. The Israelites set out at once to investigate and reach their towns in three days. The names of these towns were Gibeon, Kepera, Biruth, and Kiriath Jeram. Thank, thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. It gives you some picture to you if you're not very familiar with the Bible. That's why I asked Steve to read the, that part of the Bible. See, what happens, we have to learn from this one. In the battle, Joshua was a mighty warrior. Moses died and gone, and God took him. And Joshua and Caleb, and they are really coming to this place here. And that's why Joshua is in the forefront. And what happened, actually, we can, we, if you're not careful in our battle, we start doing something without inquiring God. See, I never in the battle, I battle alongside since I was 17 to now. And in this battle, God equipped me and training me. The whole life was a battle. 
The whole life was a battle, but it was a spiritual battle. When it turned to be natural, I just to keep myself back. Okay, this is going in a natural battle, no. When you step back and say, until God moves there, because then we, the battle should always belong to the Lord. Please tell me the battle should always belong to the Lord. That is God's battle. Human battle is often in our life, because we are also human, the battle can look like a battle, God's battle, if you're not very careful and stu stu stand back and switch on the light, we can be coming completely engaging the war, you will be defeated at the end. The battle belongs to the Lord. What we do, we encourage of the Lord. God, what is happening? God tells you, boy, you know, you've been a bit tired. You've been that. Why? You know, you just give an allowance for yourself. God tells you this. This when you switch on the light, you are able to see what God is really doing, what man is doing, and you can engage the battle cap. Enquire of the Lord. See, no matter what you are strong, what you have done, all the things you have done, always enquire of the Lord. Because your mindset, <coughs> your stronghold of the mind will not take you victory, give you the victory until you switch on the light of the armor, it tells you what is happening. What is happening with you? What is happening with you and what happened? God, you step back and say, God, to go in front of you. Come on, boy, come with me. I'm going to win the victory. I'm going to fight the battle with you. See, past victory never determine your future victories. Okay? Often people think, I've done that, done this one, and you go there, you are completely defeated. Every battle, you should be inquiring of the Lord. God, it is your battle. You may start, and then you say, step back and say, let God fight the battle. Inquiring of the Lord, inquiring of the Lord is very, very important. Otherwise, you are making treaty with the devil. You are making treaty with the... Satan comes to rob and steal and kill and destroy. But God told you something there. You have to obey God's word and engage the battle the way God said. Our, our battle is not against the flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers of darkness. So we can fight the battle, fight the battle only at God's terms and God's way he directs you. At this point, Joshua failed. Verse 14, please. Can you put verse 14 to me, please? It's always ministered to me, this word. Because I tell you, many people... Taste the food of the enemy. Please tell me, but don't taste the food of the enemy. Encourage of the Lord. You know, no matter what they say, what they did, you know, they just looked at them, looked at their, all the things and what all they said, and then started tasting the food, what they brought in there. And it's a moldy food. It's a thing, yes, it is moldy. In one, one translation say they tasted Another translation says they examine. Doesn't matter what it is, they look to the look to the food they brought in, look to the things that they brought in, rather than looking to the face of the Lord God, what are you saying? But they did not consult the Lord. In every battle, whether it is my children, our marriage, our life, our finances, our church, or the time, since 17 years, and I learned one thing to consult the Lord. God tells you something you don't want to hear sometimes. God can tell you, you idiot. And you should be prepared to hear that. When God is a speaking God, please tell never God is a speaking God. He speaks to you. He speaks to you. He speaks to you. Because you know, when you inquire the Lord, you are like this. What are you doing? What are you doing here? What are you doing there? You know, he's a speaking God. Then you have to cry before God. With all our battle, though it is for God, you have to see this battle is God want you to do. In the wisdom, in the things of God, when you get there, you can do a mistake. You know, I did a good conference for Benihin in Manchester along with another pastor and it was a great blessing. Many, many thousands of people, 20,000 people, 30,000 people there, bit of a confusion, but the meeting was a blessing and all the things happened, finished. Next time, Benihin was coming to Birmingham and I was all to, I was called, oh, Pastor Sam was an important figure. We can call him to come to Manchester, Birmingham also. When they sent a message to me, I started the journey. Because the call is there for Birmingham. I have done it in the past. I have done that, everything in Manchester, coordinated so many things with, and now I can go to Birmingham. Sorry, I'm just going to Birmingham. God started speaking to me. Why, why are you coming here? Why are you coming to Birmingham? The battle seems right in your eyes, but the battle is not God's. And I wept and cried and cried and cried. 
it's not you know everything was god everything was even in one of the greatest battle i can explain to you because it's a god and i think you know i just kept you in the manchester region to do the battle why you wanted to do that one and to come to birmingham to do the battle there so ever since i learned one thing i on the way i just cried and cried and come and repenting before god even with all your intention in god god if you don't enquire you go into something which i was not really you, you know, still you could have done all those things but god speaks to you and i give you a certain ever since i gone up to london i gone to different places you know god is it right for me to go is this battle belong to me or you or what are you doing here god says go and i i just set off to london or anywhere but on the journey all i thought was uh, oh that was a great wonderful thing in manchester you can do boy everything is great you know about it all now you arrived somewhere you are going on the way holy spirit catch you by the neck what are you doing what are you doing here what are you going to do repent before god he, he seems like a good thing what's wrong in having a crusade running a big crusade along with somebody you can have a brag about it when god is not engaged in the battle stand back and see what god you are saying looks everything is good treaty covenant is done joshua you are entering into a covenant entering into a covenant give you a night and you are tasting the food and you are not tasting the lord and see that he is good please tell me but taste the lord and see that he is good in every circumstances in every adverse situation in every difficult situation taste and see the lord is good even when you go through the valley of death even when you go through the valley of sicknesses you know even when you go through a difficult time taste and see the lord is good in a couple of years ago i was taking my wife to the operation theater and i was standing here and she was kissing me and you don't know operations so it was a minor it was a operation but still you know my sister muriel was on the same thought and she was excited to help and everything that but my heart god you know in the place i'm inquiring god what are you doing here god what are you doing in this place we still don't know that i am god what your problem is what i problem i have planned this all these things before why would sister muriel be in the oti ward on that day another 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 nurse was there and muriel was very excited oh that is pastor sam that is pastor sam and that lady used to the church life somehow she said oh it's all right it's okay and you know in lesson and you know when you go through the valley you encounter of the lord god said everything is fine the big sea is a wonderful christ the immanuel is with us and you are just laughing at him and now the battle belongs to the lord when you go through the valley he is the lord and he is the savior who fight for you i stood in the place on my own there sila has been wheeled to the operation theater you know thank glory to god you know in the evening you know people who loved me so care for me and uh, dr daniel and have sibi arrived on the scene and walking in the place how we still have to look after her everything is okay and all the people know them because they worked in the same place uh, oh how are you what, what, what are you coming there for because god knows all these things he prepare your place for you in everything even in adversity even in the difficulty god's battle and the wonderful thing was that the consultant the, the 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 surgeon was a christian even why do you get that from because god planned everything he ordained everything your path because he wanted to know how to fight the battle even in the valley even in your lowest point i wanted to fight the battle god's way not my own way god is a wonderful god and uh, miriel was very excited about this uh, the pastor sam there with this nurse and i was just focusing on god and then this nurse all oh, right okay you know three weeks later on and i was called to the same hospital to go and pray for the same nurse she was in the hospital <laughs> what i'm saying is and that family wanted me to go and pray for this nurse she had an operation or she had something i don't want to explain everything that and i think it is uh, it's my friend uh, uh i think it is uh, clarence told me you need to go and pray and i went there to pray for the same nurse because our battle is not against the flesh and blood our battle is against the living against the work of the enemy and we are a battle warrior is our lord jesus christ he bring forth healing to these people every one of the way we want to fight the battle israelites examine the food but they did not consult the lord in the warfare never do a battle without enquiring the lord the israelites sampled their provisions but they did not enquire the lord in every battle don't negotiate 
Don't negotiate with the devil. Oh, I am somehow manipulating. That is called manipulation. That is called witchcraft. Speak the word of God. This is what the word of God says. This is what your situation is. Rules of engagement of spiritual war. Learn how to engage the war. It is according to what the word of God is. When you engage the war, the victory belongs to you. Don't settle with the devil. And it, otherwise what happened, they became a snare until the end of your life in the battle. Inquire of the Lord. Kibionites, the story, is a good example for us to be how we should fight the battle. Life is a long battle. <clears throat> it's not a natural war. It's a spiritual war. That's why our battle is not against the flesh and blood, but against the principalities. Jesus very clearly said to the disciples, though to take the sword, when I'm talking about this battle, is not a natural battle. That's what Jesus said, though to take the sword will perish by the sword. So the weapons are not carnal. The weapons are spiritual, so it's not carnal. That's why Jesus said to put the sword back. Those who take the sword will perish by the sword. So it's very important in our life. We always, it is uh, right, we have to make the covenant with the right type of people. If you don't make covenant with the right type of a people, and the work is hard. You know, it's worked hard for us. You know, when I make covenant with people who worked with God, in this journey, you want to fight with people. He want to train you for the war. You need to have people already, they've got, as I said before, they need to have a big muscles if they want to build your muscles. They, you wanted to learn something about a good skill, you need to be with the people who have got this good skill. You can't be really going in a negotiation with people who never know the warfare. Never know, because they will do, they will try to make a covenant with you. Gibeonites wanted to make a covenant with you, but they are not the right people to make a covenant with you. It takes time. They need to understand that going to be, they, if they have told the truth, this is what it is, we want to make a covenant with you, Israel could have helped them. But they were coming with lie and deception, everything, trying to make a covenant. When you make a covenant, what happened? You understand you are making a covenant with the people. They are strong people. They are victorious people. Never make a covenant with the fool. When you make a covenant with the fool, he will draw you into the mud. But if you make a covenant with the strong people, they will lift you up take you to the place. It's always good to make with the covenant with the people and tell who you are. They will take you to the place you need to go. It's a, all we talked about every Sunday we pray for the apostle. What for? Those people can take you to the place you need to go. That's what's a very important thing about apostolic structure is. They take you to the place. They just believe in you. They trust in you. You trust in them. And that is an open life. And they will lift you up to the place you need to go spiritually. They are witness. They're being all through the battle. And you can learn from them. When you say people, you need to understand. You need to be with the people. You need to be with the pastor. And he knows what he's talking about. No, I can go on the battle on my own. I will fight the battle in the corner. One day you'll become a fool. You, you do not know how to do this battle. You try to negotiate and settle for less. Please tell your neighbor, don't settle for less. Israelites, if they have anchored with God, God would have told them, these are all Kibbeanites, uh, only two miles away. And they didn't come from a long distance. But you know, sometimes we are eager to taste their bread and sample their food without asking God. When you ask God, God tells you. You know, when you are joining battle is not about uh, it's not about anything else can these people take me to the where i wanted to go yes and then you are with those people here i am this is what i am but they will take you to the place you need to go it take me years it may take time it may take few years but it will take you to the place you need to go but it's a hard work it's a hard work to work with those people because you know what happened they know it is hard work where they have come and i am not a desert worker I am a submit climber. I will climb to the submit. Never give up in this battle. See, in the battle, is you need to be very bold and brave to this battle. You don't give up. You know, some people ask me, Pastor Sam, where did you get the energy from? The energy comes from the Holy Spirit. I am a weak man. But the energy comes from the Holy Spirit. It energizes you. The Holy Spirit energizes you to do the battle. But you never have a losing battle you need to have an understanding. In 2 King, chapter 13, there is a wonderful king, Johash, king of Israel. Put me 2 King, chapter 13. Thank you, that is wonderful. Let me read this, chapter 10, sorry, verse 10. It 
Elisha, come to this king, Joash, king of Judah. And I think, I think because it's a very, very, very familiar, it's not a very familiar passage, so many of you might not have read. I'm going to ask you, Joanne, would you mind, come and read this for us, please, from the screen. And uh, uh, verse 10 onwards, if you can read for us, please. Listen to this, if you've not listened that before or read that before. Joahaz, son of Joahaz, began to rule over Israel in the 37th year of King Joahaz's reign in Judah. He reigned in Samaria 16 years. But he did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to turn from the sins that Jeroboam, son of Nebet, had led Israel to commit. The rest of the events in Joahaz's reign and everything he did, including the extent of his power and his war with King Amaziah of Judea, Judah are uh, recorded in the book of history of the kings of Israel. When Joash died, he was buried in Samaria with the king of Israel. Then his son Jeroboam it began the next king, became the next king. When El Elisha was in the last illness, King Joash of Israel visited him and wept over him. My father, my father, I see chariots and charioteers of Israel, he cried. Elisha told him, get a bow and some arrows, and get a bow and some arrows, and King did he was, to was he's told. Elisha told him, but put your hand on the bow, and Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands. Then he commanded, open that eastern window, and he opened it. Then he said, shoot. So he shot an arrow. Elisha proclaimed, this is the Lord's arrow and arrow of victory over Aram, for you will completely conquer the Arameans and Apec. Then he said, now pick up the other arrows and strike them against the ground. So the king picked them up and struck the ground three times. But the man of God was angry with him. You should have struck the ground five or six times, he exclaimed. Then you would have beaten Aram until it was entirely destroyed. Now you will be victorious only three times. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. You read very well. Thank you. <coughs> I think you might have got some understanding of what this passage is about. You need to read the Old Testament. It's very powerful, very treasured, what God done with Israel. You know, I love excited about Old Testament and because there's a greatest truth there. And Elisha, Elisha come to this king and to equip him. And the man of God was very angry. It seems like he's not asking you to go for a battle. He is just checking this man, checking this man out, how he would behave. Because God is interested in his men, he raised up men all through the generation, tried to equip another generation, tried to make them strong, and tried to make them to fight the battle, and equip them, they are powerful people. And now to this king, he asked him, take the arrow and shoot. Take the bows and do this one. And he started, it doesn't make any sense to them. Some of the people, I tell you, they can fight only a natural battle. They don't know how to fight the bracha, spiritual battle because they've never been with those people who engage in the warfare. They take a runner, all the time a runner. They don't know how to stand with the people and watch very carefully what is happening rather than, you know, they do something in their life and miss the battle. And this king is one of them. And he just, Elisha was trying to see and help him and understand how he will fight the battle. He's just training because he's going to be, Elisha has finished the battle. If you ask him, he may say the thing, I ran and I done a good battle. I finished the work in the next chapter, Elisha is gone. Shall we shout hallelujah? He gone to the heaven. But he wanted to equip his people in such a way, he would say the same thing as Paul was saying, I done the good battle, I finished the battle and I got the victory and the crown is waiting for us. That's what Elisha would have said. Before that, he's just making sure this king is doing the right thing. <clears throat> Verse 18, then the king said to him, take the arrows. Please tell him, but take the arrows. Sir. <laughs> you know, sometimes God would say to you, take the arrows in your hand. Take the arrows in your hand. And he's told, Elisha told him, strike the ground. You know, you don't strike the ground with the arrow. You try to shoot them. 
But God, sometimes, you know what happens when God is telling you, oh, he's stupid, isn't he? Really doing this thing. Why is he doing this one? The arrows, you put them on the bows and shoot. What is he talking? Many people don't spiritual think, they don't make understanding because what you are doing looks like stupid. 50,000 people here and you've got two fish and five loaves. It seems like stupidest idea because you know what? You know only a natural battle. That jar, the alabaster, could have really been so valuable, could be fed so many people. Why it is broken at the feet of Jesus? For the natural man, it doesn't make any sense. Because they never switch on the light of the armor of God, they can't see. <clears throat> no. Elisha, just get real. You're old. You're too old to do this job. What are you asking me to do? Arrow is to be, you know, aimed at the enemy. He asked me to strike them. Oh, he said so. Spiritually, don't be stupid. Joyfully. Please tell your neighbor joyfully. It doesn't make any sense. He's asking me to beat the ground. The, ba the bow would be broken. It's a mud. Why you want to do this one? He's too old. He's too old. He's gone cranky. Ask him to. Spiritually, don't be, don't be, you know, the battle warriors, when you are with them, their muscles are big. Their spiritual muscles are big. Even though they look saying something, it seems like they're going to die. And... But the spiritual muscles are strong. And we need to know. We need to feel. We need to become like that. You know, when my, when I was, when my children were very small, I think it's Kesia, I think. My shoe used to the size 11 or 10 English size or European size. Kesia used to put her feet inside. You know, most of the children done, does those things. They're just dragging alongside. If she taken and she used to drag along like this. And she was so proud she was walking with the shoes of dad. Have you done it, Paul, yourself? <laughs> so they do. They do. But you know, this is what is important in their life. And one day I could see her because she's standing here and playing the guitar and worshipping God. The man of God. Because he didn't make any sense. He's asking me to do. He was resenting. He was resentful. He was thinking, I'm sure that's what he's thinking. Mm, ding, ding, ding. It's not about ding, ding, ding. What is there? Are you ready for the battle? He struck only three times, the Bible says. <clears throat> the man of God was angry with him. Oh, you come to the house and you're getting angry with him. He struck it only three times and stopped. Because what Elisha is saying is rather stupid. Repent! Because in your battle you want to have the victory. Don't try to be smart before God. It's not Elisha. Finish the race. Almost finishing the race. And he just done a good battle. He's telling you. The man of God was angry with him. I'm glad it is written there on the Bible. And said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. You know, five or six times. Then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you will defeat it only three times. Sometimes, you know, this is all the thing you learn. You should have done it at least five or six times. Because you know why? I believe in you, Elisha. I believe in you, Elisha. What you say doesn't make any sense to me. I am Naaman. What you say doesn't make any sense to me. I'm going to jump up and down in the dirty water of Jordan. I'm going to be healed. What you say doesn't make any sense to me. But I know that you have done greater things. I believe in you. I'm going to strike on this mud five times, six times, seven times, ten times until you ask me to stop. That is called obedience. It is not making a sense out of it and try to be smart before God. You defeat only three times and you never defeat them. Shall we stand before the living God? God, I want to destroy completely.